So uh, yeah. But, I'm sorry. Can we uh, stop for a second? I actually screwed up. I didn't hit the uh, uh, go live. So let me just go through the introduction again. Yeah. Quickly. Okay. So uh, okay. Sorry, folks. I uh, a little uh, mess up here. So. Uh, Oh, should I stop sharing? Yeah. Okay, I had to turn that sound off. Okay, a uh, little uh, technical difficulty. Okay, uh, so uh, we're opening the parentheses for 2021. Welcome to List NYC. I'm your host, Arthur Smiles. While I have your attention, take a moment to hit the subscribe and the notification button so you don't miss any of the videos that are coming this year. Okay, I'd like to give, uh, now I'd like to, uh, like to introduce our speaker. Our speaker, Robert Birding, with Joe Armstrong and Mike Williams, developed the language Erlang at the Ericsson Computer Science Lab. It was designed for distributed computing and fault tolerance. Alan Kane noted that, quote, Erlang is much closer to the original ideas I had about objects and how to use them, which is the highest praise I've heard coming from the inventor of object-oriented programming. He also happened to be the star in the movie, Erlang the Movie, a historical gem you can find on YouTube. He is currently the principal language expert at Erlang Solutions Limited. Tonight, he'll be talking about his language, list flavored Erlang. And with that, I welcome Robert Birding. Hello, Robert. Hello, hello. Uh, yeah, the mic should be working great. I just, I just want to say, yeah, um, look at the Erlang the movie, the sequel instead. It's basically saying the same thing, but in a much funnier way. Much, and we didn't do that. That was really funny. So yes, this is about LFE. And now I'll click up here and we'll see what happens. Okay. Am I sharing? No. Um, yeah, you're not sharing, but you're. Uh, we, we see you on, on the screen. So. Yeah, so I will share my screen. And then we will do that. And now we click things on. Uh, now I can see it. So this is a bit about it. It's a real lisp. It's in the Allen ecosystem, and I'll explain what, what this means, what I mean for it here. So one thing, um, I, I know this is not an Allen talk, but to, to very briefly try and explain why our LFE looks like it does, right? I, I'm just going to go through some of the basic principles of Allen, and I promise you it will go very quickly. If you've seen this, start screaming, and I'll keep even faster. So the, the goal with doing LFE, LFE is probably about... 12, 15 years old now, since I started playing around with it a long time, a long time ago. So the goal I had was, I went, it was going to be a proper lisp, a, a real lisp, right? Not just a quick hack. Um, it was going to be running on the Beam, which is a virtual machine for Erlang, and I wanted to be efficient implementation of this, right? It's something that's actually fast enough to be usable for it. And it had to interact with all the, all the libraries that you have in Erlang, OTP, and other languages running on top as well, too. So th these were sort of the base requirements to make, uh, which I wanted when doing LFE. So I'll look a little bit about the background, a little bit about the Erlang ecosystem. I promise it's only a little bit, and then we'll get in more into LFE. And the reason for talking about the, the, back, the Erlang background of things is just to try and explain why LFE looks like it does, OK? That, that's that's the main goal here. And as Arthur was mentioning, this was from the computer science lab. And uh, one of the problems we were looking at there is how to make uh, programming of these type, uh, type switches much more efficient and easier, but keeping the same characteristics. And the basic characteristics you have of these type of systems, um, this comes from a thesis from Bjorn Decker, who was our boss in the lab. These are some of the points here. There was a lot of concurrency going on. You might, you might at least back in those days, you might have a switch with a few hundred thousand connections, tens of thousands of calls going on at the same time, plus everything that, everything that the, um, the switch is doing. You have timing constraints. Things have to happen at a certain time and um, not take too much time or things like this for it. This, for example, uh, forces the system to be non-blocking. It is just not, you just can't stop the whole system for 10, 15 seconds to do a garbage collect. That's just not, um, available is that just just acceptable right you need distribution to get real fault tolerance you need continuous operation which allows you to upgrade the system you must also be fault tolerant because you accept the fact things are going to go wrong um, you need to be able to detect these handle these manage these and make the system keep going so you never crash and 
And what we found later was this wasn't just telecoms. So um, some reflections here. We were not out to implement a functional language. Our language is a simple functional language, but we were, that wasn't a goal to make it functional. Uh, we, yes, we implemented the actor model more or less, but that wasn't our goal. Um, I didn't actually even know about the actor model until later when I read a report in the paper saying that Alan implemented it and I went out to look for it. We more or less did. Uh, we were trying to solve a problem. We had this problem. We had our ideas for solving it. We had a user group who gave us feedback on our ideas and said, are these good ways? Is this a good solution for the problem or not? Could we do it other ways, et cetera, et cetera. For it? So we got a lot of feedback for it. Very problem oriented. It was a very iterative process as well. There's some more reflections here. This made the development very focused. What did we want to do? Solve the problem. What, what should it look like? I don't care as long as it so helps solve the problem. And this, this meant we had a very clear set of criteria for what we're going to do. Was it useful or did it not? Did it or did it not help to build the system? A number of times we came up with, um, we thought were fantastic solutions to the problem, but then we found out we just totally misunderstood the problem. So just remove it and just get on with it. And that's, again, getting back to that's what we're doing for it. So where did we end up for it? So, yeah, sold around this. And it provides direct support for all this stuff. So this gets us into the what we're talking about, the ecosystem here, which I was mentioning. And that's this ecosystem diagram is an old one. I think this is quite not. I like, prefer this one. This is a set of languages running on top of the beam, Allen and OTP. So, for example, you have Allen, of course. Elixir now is a very popular one. LFE is there. Um, I have a prologue implementation as well, and a Lua implementation running on top if you want to use that, and other things as well. Uh, there are other languages done for it. And by making these things follow the rules, um, you can get very nice, efficient things. They, they can work together very well, which is what we want. So where do we end up? So the o o OTP, the Open Telecoms platform, this is just a set of design patterns for so the language, the base language is pretty simple at a low level. It's actually very simple. Making it simple was actually difficult. And here we have a set of patterns that help you build things on top of this. We have things we call generic behaviors that help you implement design patterns as well. And again, there's absolutely nothing about telecom in OTP. The name is purely um, uh, politically correct inside a telecom company. So this. I know we've sometimes lost customers because they say we're not a telecom company, so why should I use our line? Because it's a telephone, mm -hmm. telephone, but isn't. Sorry, any was a question or? Uh, no, I was just uh, agreeing with you. Um, okay. Actually, Erlang the movie, uh, the sequel has a really great, uh, great name for uh, OTP. Oh right? yeah, that, <laughs> actually, that actually I can just say now as a quick comment. <laughs> Some people jumped on the meaning of P and didn't like that, thought that was very derogatory and nasty and things like this for it. But it, it's a it's a scream. It was done yeah. by a guy called Garrett Smith. Um, mm -hmm. He made a number of other very funny films as well, too. Yeah, I think people need to have a little sense of humor with it and not take it. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Literally. <laughs> so go on. What's the beam? What is the beam? It's a virtual machine to run Allen. So um, what this means is that the beam, the Erlang language and the beam are very closely interacted, integrated. The beam runs Erlang, uh, that's what it does, right? Everything is in there for running Erlang for it. And this means all the things you find in the Erlang language, they're all there. So the, the lightweight, the massive concurrency, that's done in the beam for you. Uh, the asynchronous communication, which is the base, the process isolation, the error handling, continuous evolution, the soft real timeness, the fact that that the system does not block when it's garbage collecting. All this is inside the inside the beam. Uh, for example, I don't, I never have to worry about a process writing, a, say, a process which loop does, does a type loop blocking the system because the beam does not allow it to block the system. It'll, it'll schedule out every once in a while. The non-blocking the preemptive scheduler. It's transparent multi-core. It will quite happily grab every core it can get hold of, and will load balance across them by just by default. Right? So thinking about writing applications for four or six cores or 20 cores, it's just most of the time just something you never have to worry about. It just does it. There are a lot of powerful introspection tools. Uh, we can look at maybe look at a tool called Observer later if we have time and interest. And lots of interfaces the outside world. This is just more, more type system type things, right? And again, I don't have to worry about this. It's just there. Mm -hmm. So having to think about 
about making sure my no process blocks the system. That is just a concept I haven't had to worry about for 25 years, right? Running the other. And then we've got the language things. Um, we have immutable, we don't do mutable, we don't do share, and we don't do global. That's it in the data. I cannot mutate data, I cannot share data, it's not global. And this again is built into the low level machine. This is just not our own feature. This is just built into the machine. I cannot get around that. We've, there's a predefined set of data types. There are no user defined data types in the system. That's it. You can We fake it, but there, are, there aren't any there. There's support for pattern matching. There's support for functional language and stuff like this. There's also a, a handling of code, modules and code, which are, which are very different. And yeah. So the, all these things are baked into, into the system. So the, you, 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 if you want to make an efficient, implement a language efficiently on it, that's it, right? That you have to follow these things. Work yeah. Work with. I, I have a question about the predefined uh, data types. Was that yeah. a um, was that due to time constraints, or is there uh, a logic to that? Okay, the, 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 uh, it was mainly a logic because one of the things mm -hmm. one of the things the system allows you to do is to di to dynamically reload code while the system is running, mm -hmm. which means that um, if you had user defined data types, that that would mean maybe a user defined data type disappears or changes while the system is running. And well, what about all the other modules that are using this data type? It just doesn't work, right? We could not we could not find a way to make that work. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so yeah. I, I also have like a kind of a question relating to that. It, like, are are the is the code like shared across all nodes? Do all nodes have access to all the codes, all the different um, you know pieces of code that are running, or uh, different nope. distributed kind of um, in a in an ad hoc manner? It's it's an ad hoc manner in that sense. Right. So so, so even if you had predefined data types, not every node is going to know about every data type. So nope. if happens to run across some data, it may, it may not even know what type, what that type yeah. means. Yeah. 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 So okay. now, now you do because you have this fixed set of data types and everything uses that. Well, we fake user defined data types on top of them, but at the low level it does that. So that means all the systems can talk to each other. Um, you can actually, you can actually talk to systems that are running quite old versions as well. Three or four, three or four generation old versions, they'll still interact with each other. There's a lot put into this. And that also means that if I'm running multiple nodes, there's no requirements they're running the same system or the same software. Or if I've got a module foo on all of them, they don't have to be the same foo. They can be different foos. It's all local to each one. It makes the dynamic, it makes the distribution. Think of, it's pretty close to if I'm running lots of different machines together. I mean, some of them might be running Windows, some of them might be running Mac, some of them might be running Ubuntu or whatever with different versions of everything. They can still talk to each other. It's the same thing here. But yeah. And uh, XKCD, this is this is it, of course, right? That's, that's I know. Uh, he's, he, he says some things so very well. Yes. Okay. So that's a bit about what, and these are the properties of the underlying system, which I cannot do anything about if you want to run it efficiently. So uh, you can run other things on top. I've, I've, I've written um, an implementation of Lua uh, in our language, which implements, which implements Lua 5.3 on top. And Lua has all the things our language, that Beam does not do. It has shared global mutable data, mm -hmm. uh, which we don't do. But that means I put a layer on top which implements that. So that becomes less efficient. Mm -hmm. That, by the way, is online if, you, if anyone's interested. That is interesting. So yeah, the wrong place, for, wrong place for it. But yeah. So what elephant? What it isn't, right? It's not an implementation of scheme. It's not an implementation of common lisp, and it's not an implementation of closure or any other lisp for that matter I know of, because the properties that Beam makes this language is diff difficult to implement and be efficient. But what is it then, right? It's a proper Lisp. Well, with all the most of the, the typical Lisp features you want in there or you're used to, but based on within these limitations, it runs on the standard Erlang VM. So you, there's no need, the, you don't have to have a special version of VM with hacks in it or anything like this for it. And it exists with everything else running there. They can interact with other languages running on top of it. Okay. 
So now I wanted to start describing LFE. That's just the background for trying to describe why it looks like it does. So look a bit about data types, modules, functions, Lisp one versus Lisp two. I don't know if that, does that war still exist. Um, um, I don't know really. I, I, you know, yeah, like I guess kind of. I I, I started with uh, Lisp two and uh, common Lisp, but then I I kind of got annoyed with Lisp two <laughs> and moved to Scheme. So I think nah. be, I think that we no longer fight wars in the Lisp community. There are too few of us. <laughs> uh, we, disagree. we disagree, but we don't. Sure. Do well, well I, I'm I'm used to I'm used to Lisp two, so we'll as well show you LFE is a Lisp two. And there's actually I, I I can give you a good reason for it. Well, whether you think and, it's um, also uh, could could you uh, press the uh, the uh, video icon because we I like to also see you while you're talking. Uh, what do I press? Um. Uh, ah, the, sorry, that, yeah, I'll turn yeah, that off. Video. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. There you now go. Okay, great. Okay, now we're back. Now we'll go back on to look at this thing. Sorry, I, I, I didn't see things. Right, okay. So that's that's what we'll look at. So data types. These are the basic data types that exist inside um, inside the Allen inside the Allen system at all. We have numbers, of course, integers and floats. We've got atoms. Uh, they're similar to Lisp symbols. We have lists. We have tuples, which are vectors. We have maps basically hash maps. We have binary data, which are really cool, which I am a bit shamed, I'm a bit um, depressing that other languages haven't implemented it. Uh, we have a lot of opaque types as well for it, that reference things. We have, well, if you create a process, the process has something called a peer to process identifier, which is a data type, a few other things like this. And that's it. So if I want to make if I want to make a structure, I will use tuples. I'll use maps, tuples, and lists to build structures. And um, I can I can we for example, Erlang has something called records, which are built on top of tuples. So they're implemented with tuples with a with a, with a syntax for it. There's a syntax for this in LFE as well. Um, uh, Elixir they have something they call structs, which are built on top of maps, which do similar things. But you just don't. There's no other way around this. Um, so atoms and symbols. So an atom here only has it, it, it only has it only has a name. That's all it has. It's not like uh, Lisp symbols, which can have function definitions or values or things like that. An atom doesn't do that. It has a name, and that's it. Right? You can ask it its name, and uh, you create an atom. Where you can ask it, and you get this name back. And there's only one namespace for all atoms. There, 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 there are no there are no namespaces, hierarchical namespaces, or anything like this. Which means we can we don't have the equivalent of common list packages or namespaces. We just can't do that. If I create an atom, if I create the atom foo, that's the same atom foo on all on, on the whole node. And it's just one foo. You can munge names if you wanted to. You could you could do something like say if I want foo in the package bar, I could I can make the atom foo colon bar to do that. But that you don't really want to do that because it just it just ruins things in the long run. It, it looks like a nice hack, but it doesn't do that. So we just don't do that. Uh, we don't have a Boolean data type. We just use the atoms, true or false, for Boolean system. It works straight away. Um, binaries are nice. I, just, I, I think I, I didn't do binaries, but I, but they're quite, they're a very nice feature. So binaries are just a pack of binary data, either 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 um, bytes or bits as well too. So I can make bits. I can make a binary which is thirteen bits long or things like this for it. And I can put put it together by doing so. This binary, well, the binary one two three. That's just three bytes containing one two three. The second one down here has got a field T, which is a 16 bit. It's a 16 bit integer, and the, and the bytes are stored in little endian. Then I've got two fields of four bits here. I've got a 32 bit float, and I've got B, which just happens to be a bit string, whatever that happens to be in float. And I can use these to put together anything, right? Which means, like, um, interfacing protocol sending binary data becomes very simple. Yeah. It's, a, it's just so fantastic. Binary so, records. Yeah, it is really good. This bind, this is a binary for an IP version four packet header. This completely describes it. So it's got the version in four bits. It's got the length in four bit, the header length. It's got the service type, total length, ID size, three flag, three bit flags, which I've never really understood what they are. They always seem to be zero. Fragment offsets, time to lives, everything. Here we've got the source IP and the destination IP. They're just thirty two bit numbers, and all the rest is just a just big pack of bytes. And this binary I can use 
to either to make um, to make a packet, or if I get if I get a packet in, I can use this as a pattern to just pull it apart in one go. So the system does all the shifting and anding and oring and such inside, and I just don't have to worry about that. Why this doesn't exist? If it does exist, I've missed it. But why it doesn't exist in other languages? I don't know. It's just so nice. Right? So uh, basically, what you're telling us is that if er if we had Erlang in the entire network stack of the internet, we can go from IPv4 to IPv6 in like a minute. Yeah, just, it's just <laughs> not a packet. It's just not a packet. Right? That, that's easy. It, 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 yeah, it, it's just. I mean, writing protocols, you just go in and look at Wikipedia for the protocol and write the binary, binary description of it and you're done, right? Well, not, not quite that simple, but that basic idea. So, so of course, we have support for binaries in, in, in our language. This is in the LFE. This is the LFE syntax for it. This is the LFE syntax for an IP version of 4 uh, Modules and functions, okay, they are very basic. So don't think... Uh, packages or things like this don't think classes a module is a collection of functions that's basically it right so all I can put in a module is a function instead of functions right? and it's a flat module namespace as well there's no hierarchical module namespace which means you have to have to be work a bit when you were giving modules names and they're the, they're the complete unit of code handling so if I'm working with code, I'm working with modules. So I, I cannot take a module, for example, and add a function to it or remove a function to it. It means I have to rebuild the whole module when I'm doing that. That's just a limitation of the system. And this was done for, 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 for making it even easier to do dynamic code handling while the system is running. So I can, I can load modules while the system is running. I can delete modules. I can over reload modules, everything like this. For and um, this also means that um, functions only exist in modules, real functions only exist in modules, and the, the code in modules is compiled. There's no implement there's no sort of implementation of having things uh, being interpreted or not or something like this for. So all you've got in modules are compiled code. Um, in the REPL, I, impl I, I implement functions locally to the REPL by implementing an interpreter which does that for. And another interesting feature here is um, there are no interdependencies between modules. Modules are, are completely uh, self-contained. I can remove one, I can put one in and blunt like that. Um, why I mentioned the last one here, in, in the basic Erlang system, you have and can have one module per file, and the module name has to be the same as the file name. I've extended that to LFE, so you can have multiple modules in one file. I don't know if that's a good idea or not, but yeah, that's there. I can show you some uses of it later, for examples later. Um, so here's a module. This is a module. We, we, we define the module to arith, and we're exporting three functions, out of two arguments, out of three arguments, and sub of two arguments. So we have to just say, and here I'm defining add of two arguments, which is just plus AB, and add of three arguments with ABC, which is plus ABC, and sub of AB is at minus AB. So it resembles common lisp. Um, we can do more things with pattern matching, but that's that's it. Um, actually, def module defun and defun all macros anyway, so they expand to things. Um, what do you mean by no interdependency? I mean, clearly, a module may need things from another module. That's a dependency. Yeah, but but there's no dependency. It's in the module itself. If I need something from another module, I will call a function in, in the other module. So if okay. I'm in the module foo. And I, and I need to run a function in module bar, I will call that function in module bar. Yeah, sure. So there's there's no import. Like you have export there, but there's no import? There's no import. Well, there is an import, but it doesn't, it, it, it's just a name hack. There, there's no, export is just saying, these are the functions that you can see from the outside. That's all export does. There's no okay. import in that. Sense. So if I, if I happen to have a function here, well, I don't have one, if I didn't ex export add three, for example, then you couldn't see it from the outside. And then you couldn't call it from the outside either. Right, so are you stuck with the inside names when you call from the outside? Yep. So that means, well, I don't know there, what there, Yeah, the, 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 you're stuck with that. And you typically, when you're calling a function from the outside, you have to give the module name and the function. Okay. I so mean, it's you, really you about fully qualified names. Sorry? It's about fully qualified names. Yeah. 
yeah, you need that. You, you can you can do right. syntactic hacks where I right. don't have to write that. So in a module, I can say, okay, if I call the if I call the module Baz, I'm actually that I'm actually meaning to call the module Baz and from the call the function Baz from the module foo instead. Right? That's yeah. that's just a syntactic hack. Um, yeah, one thing we cannot do again. This is a low level limitation. I cannot have functions with have variable number of arguments. Each function has a fixed number of arguments. So we see here, add has two. This add here has two arguments. This add here has three arguments, and they're different functions. And yet, okay. plus, plus, uh, plus is because plus is a hack, and that plus is actually a macro in terminal. I see. That expands to it. And these are different functions. So if I call add with two arguments, I'll get this one. If I call add with three arguments, I'll get that one. If I call add with four arguments, I'll get an error because there is no add of four arguments. This is again, mm -hmm. so you can't get you can you can hack your way around this, but then then as things start getting ugly and the interface gets difficult. And in the expert for add two, does that does that basically do currying to create a function that where the first oh. argument's are already two? Oh. This says we're exporting the function add with two arguments. Oh, okay. It says the number of arguments. Got yeah, it. that's the number of arguments for it. I see. I should have put another function here in terms of it, yes. Um, and modules, there are attributes. That's just a bit of a module, a bit of module metadata. We've got function definitions. We have macro definitions as well. And I can actually do compile time function definitions. But um, I, I can't really export macros in that sense, right? You can't. There isn't. You can export macros, but it's a bit of a hack. But well, it does. It looks looks good and it works, but um, you can't do that. So the only thing I can export from a module is a function. That's it. Now. This is this is just what we have. That's it. Right? And again, if I want to do something different, like implementing packages or something like this, I'd, I'd have to put a layer on top of it, and that would definitely bring down the efficiency. There's just no way around it. Um, yeah, Lisp one versus Lisp two. Um, that's well, basically how you evaluate symbols in the function position and the argument position. In Lisp, in Lisp one, you take both. You take both from the function foo here and from the, and from the argument bar. You take the value. In Lisp two, from the function, you take the function function definition, function binding, and, and in the argument, you take the value binding. So that's two. Okay. This is scheme. This is common Lisp, Mac Lisp, and well, list machines as well. For that so why? Why do one here? Well, I think I thought it made it more consistent. So if if, if we're running in a list one world here, I could define I can define foo define foo of two arguments and foo of three arguments. But inside bar, if I want to make a, a local a local variable function called baz, it can only be one of them, right? Because I cannot define baz with two arguments of baz, because then you run into the problem that just to say, just the value of, of the symbol or the atom. I just felt that was inconsistent. So what you do now is you have an flet. Again, a lot of the syntax is taken from common list. So here I, I can define two functions, baz, local functions, baz, one with one argument, one with two arguments, and I can call them down here. If I, I just felt this matched better what I can do with global functions. So that that's why. Uh, this you can do this as well too. You can use this and. and bind this to a value so I get the variable local variable baz has the value which is a function I can call that but I can also use these functions like this but, uh, so right it's actually a list two plus I can say because you can have the same name with lots of different argument numbers but, uh, um, but again this is this is not any property of the atom itself this is a property I put of the atom as a function name okay okay so we have pattern matching, and we use pattern matching everywhere, and we've got direct support. I don't know, is, is, is everyone programmed language with patterns and pattern matching? This um, is an I think thing. a lot. I think a lot of uh, the mo uh, modern programming languages. Yeah, they um, do. Haskell has it. Uh, Rust has it now. Um, yeah, yeah. But certainly, there's no problem with having common list and scheme libraries that do it. Yeah, yeah. and I think there is a scheme thanks to the ability to write your own syntax. Yeah, <sighs> yeah. Well, I give you some ability here with macros, but still. But again, this is this is built into the machine, 
So we use it everywhere for function clauses. We'll see what that is. I can use let case and receive in macros. I can I can um I can use mac I can use pattern matching in macros as well when they're selecting things for macros. So I can make it easy to write a macro with different number of arguments. Just use patterns for it. And this is how you bind variables. So if I bind local variables, I have a pattern here which might be a variable and an expression. So you evaluate the expression, then you then you match against the pattern and but check it's the same thing and bind variables and what have you. Right? Then you use them. I've got a case for doing that. That just evaluates that expression, then it then selects, steps down and selects the first of these we call clauses here, which has a matching pattern. I receive that's for receiving messages. Again, we're using patterns to select which messages we want to receive. We use patterns everywhere. So I can define a function with multiple patterns. So I have multiple clauses, and I can which clause I select depends on, on the patterns. Um, the reason I'm using the square brackets here in the argument list is just because it's easier to read. So square brackets and, and parentheses uh, are equivalent. I just find that easier to read. So I can use pattern matching to select. I have a con here as well too, uh, which does test, but it also has a pattern matching test. So if you want to do that as well. Too. It's just too good not to have it everywhere. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, once, you, once you're there, you sort of wonder, how could I not have it? <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, I kind of created yeah. my own little pattern matching uh, macro for myself, so. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. don't have it, you just want to invent that it. That I can fully understand. So here's just some interest, just some examples of defining functions using pattern matching. So the function Ackerman here is a function of two arguments. Right, that's why we've got two arguments in the list here. And if the first argument is zero, we'll choose that clause, and then we'll the second uh, the second uh, argument we're bound to the variable n, and we'll just return n plus one. Now, if this first argument is not zero, but the second argument is zero, we'll choose that clause, and then we'll call that a, well, n will be bound to the value of the first argument, and we choose, we call our a command mi minus m one one like that. And otherwise, you have the general case like this. Again, I mean. That's just it. So we have multiple clauses here. And here's another example. We could define a member like this more traditional using cond. So if, if um, x is a member of ease, if ease is empty, then of course it's false. Uh, if x equals the car of it, then of course it's true. Otherwise, we call member recursively and step down. But we can also do this using patterns down here. So here we say, OK, if, if, if the second argument is a cons, and x equals e, we return true. If it's if it's not, we call ourselves recursively on the on the, on the rest of the list. If we hit the end, the empty list, then it's false. Okay, Again, so does this mean false rack, so I have to quote them actually. Yeah. Does this mean that the beam VM is properly tail recursive? Yes. Oh, good. If you, if your function is written like that, yeah, this is just something we had. I mean, that how, how do we write? Um, well, I've just got some code examples later, but um, how do we write state machines? Well, you have a function for a state, and you call the other state when, you, when, you, when you're changing, call the other yep. function when you're changing state, so you just have to have it. It's just that's our, that's, that's okay. Schemer's favorite example for why tail calling is not an optimization. It's a thing you need no. to be able to rely on. Yeah, that's one thing that really surprised me when I saw closure. Um, they didn't have yeah, well, they're on the JVM. Yeah, but, yeah but, exactly. And so they... I. Uh, their goal with, with uh, closure in particular was to make it efficient for the JVM, which means since the JVM didn't have it, they didn't uh, support it. But, 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 yes, but no. There's an implementation of Erlang for the JVM called Erjang. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that implements tail, tail calls, if it, not just recursion, but uh, tail call optimizations because the language needs it. So it, it can do it, and it does it quite efficiently as well, too. But how, how does it do that while retaining the correct security context? Yeah. It, right. it retains everything. It, 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 you can take your Erlang system and uh, move it across to that and run it there and it'll just work, right? Right. You can move Erlang there, but can you call back into Java and retain your security yeah. context correctly? That, I don't know. You, I know you can call into Java, yes, because a lot right. of things are Yeah, so the, re the reason why they didn't do that is because they couldn't figure out how to do, like, one of my professors, Dan Wallach, figured out how to do that in the JVM um, mm. job, but Sun never, never used his um, okay. proposal. But there, it's it's it can't implement security um, and tail calls the way that they have it right now. 
Yeah, that that I I don't know. I know the guy who did it. Uh, he was a Dane. Well, he's a Dane. He he, he worked this out for it because his goal was to implement Allo on the JVM. Right. So yeah. Um, so uh, yeah. before we continue, I want to just uh, read some comments uh, concerning this in particular. First of all, uh, we got a couple of comments about other languages that have uh, pattern matching Scala and on the chat, uh, it was JavaScript also have it. Also, yeah. uh, Duncan McGregor has a comment saying uh, pattern matching in function heads is phenomenal. And he also mentioned that you can you can use cons literals in pattern matching too. You just have to quote mm. the things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yes, so yes, I know. Um, I have a very good link to a, 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 a short little movie Duncan's made. I'll, I'll give it later on the chat. Okay. Um, he's giving a presentation of that. He's, he's used LFE to implement a music generation system. So yes, which is quite funny and um, it's only a short little movie, but the music's wonderful. So yeah, of course we have macros. We could not have a lisp without macros, right? Uh, yeah, well you can, but what, you couldn't do that. Um, they're unhygienic, but when you create variables that they're you're creating them with a let, so they're scoped, so it's not as bad as you would think. Um, there is no gen sim, and that is also a, that's a thing you run into with the underlying virtual machine. That when you when you create an atom, it goes in. It's interned in the atom table, and there it stays. It never goes away. So if you put build too many atoms, you'll fill the atom table, and that crashes the system. It takes about half a second to do it. I can show you some code later that does it. But yeah, so that's why it's, un, it's unsafe on long-lived systems. So I just don't do it. Um, their compile time at the moment, but except when you're running the REPL. There you can define local macros in there as well. Um, I'd never allow you to write macros that shadows the core forms. So I cannot write a macro called cons. Well, I can write one, but it'll just never be used. Right? And this, again, is just to protect yourself um, getting into infinite loops and things like this for it. It means the core forms, there's a, big, there's a big predefined set of core forms. They, they just always do what they expect them to. Um, I can call, I can define macros in modules and I can export macros from modules. So I can define a macro inside a model and I can export that. And then I can call macros and other other modules by writing module call on macro. This is the same syntax for calling functions and other modules as well. But if that's a macro, then then the, then the macro expander when I'm expanding macros will check if this is a macro and then we'll do the expansion while I'm doing that. And the macros are pretty straight. Well, it's a macro interface. I can define a macro here. We have the back quote. We have the back quote macro, of course. So I can define something like this, which just expands to something with plus, plus with values of A and B in there. I can do an average like this. This expands. So we get the we plus that we, we take all these and make an expansion of all these. So let's do plus blah, 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 all the arguments and just divide it with the value of the length and things like this. I can do list stuff and stuff like this. So we we got all the macros you can put. They're not given that you have these um, fixed and immutable modules unless you recompile them. What do you do about the problem of uh, a mac a non backquote macro that actually constructs stuff using a using um, using functions that come from somewhere else that may not even have been seen yet? Tough. Okay. Yeah. No. That that, that that's one that's one thing. Um, the basic system. I mean, you you load in you load in modules, and um, mm -hmm. okay, there, there there is a bit of there's quite a lot. Well, one very very nice support for you that it will automatically load modules for you. So if I call it, if I call a module if I call the module zip, and, it, and there is no module zip, then the code server in the system will go out and try and find a module zip and load it for you. And then, then, then they right, run. but does this happen at compile time? No, this happens at runtime. Does this happen at compile time? Yeah, but at compile time, if you're going to have compiler is the compiler is written in Erlang itself, so it's just running Erlang code. Ew. So that, so that, that means that you you can have backquote macros like this, but you can't have macros that execute arbitrary Lisp code. Yeah, yeah, they can. 
you can do that but because at compile time the compiler is just it's just an app it's just Allen, right it's written in Allen. it's just just an, an Allen function like any other sort of Allen modules like any other modules and if, if you have a macro that calls some function in another module then then they can say well i'm evaluating this does the module exist no then i'll try and load it for you and the code server does that at low level for you right at so the, inside the, the only thing you cannot guarantee is that i have the same well, module when i'm compiling as when i'm running it later yeah okay yeah but it does this and the code loading works just by by default just automatically right? mm -hmm. and this is just a little bit of code example here this is from the old telecoms um this code if we go back 25 years actually worked 30 years actually worked because we had it we had a little implementation of it we had a little, done our little telephone operating system we could talk to our own little exchange for it but so here we're using we here we have two processes basically running we've got we're making a call and the phone's ringing so we've got the a side which made the call and the b side we've got we've got separate processes for these and they're talking with each other so this is the address the a side knows the, the b appeared in the b address so what happens here is that if someone lifts the receiver it's going to get an on hook message here the atom on hook and then it sends a Oh, sorry, if someone puts the, if the person calling the receiver puts the receiver down, it's getting getting an on-hook message. Then it sends cleared across the other side. It stops the tone, then then goes to the idle state by calling the idle function. And here we see an example of the tail call optimization. So that and on the B side here, it's going to get a cleared, which is going to stop in the ring, and it will go to idle. If the B side lifts, it gets an off hook here. It stops the ringing. It sends answered across the A side, then goes to the speech state here by calling the speech function. And here we get an answer. We stop the tone. We tell the tell the connect the operator to tell us to switch to connect the, the A and B side together. And we go to speech as well. Now here we have a problem to show why we why we can't block. So the, all the all the communications app is is asynchronous. Why we can't block here. Because while we're sitting here, someone might try and call us, which means we'll get a C's message coming in. This is a tuple C's here with a PID. And if, if we have to handle that immediately and send back rejected, and then we st and then we just loop and stay in the ringing side. We have to do that on both sides. And what we do in this very simple case, if we get any other any other message, we just ignore it. That's what the underscore matches there. We just ignore it. Just keep going. So this is a bit of example for. It. And. I don't have the rest of the system, but this 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 is sort of real code in the sense that it actually worked. And this is just some examples of again we're using pattern matching for the messages and things like this for doing. I guess we're saying by the way sends a message sends a message to this process it sends the message the atom rejected in that case. Yeah, sorry. I guess receive blocks until some message comes in. Yeah, I can give a timeout if I want to as well. Okay. But um, yeah, so here's another bit of real code. This is a virus. This is a virus code that actually works, right? Um, so I, I, it's in the module virus. It only exports two functions, start. There's no zero arguments. It starts with one argument. And I start it by calling start. Now, what that is going to, what that does, what this does is it goes out and finds that, well, this module here is a macro which expands the module name, in this case, just virus. That's a predefined, you get that macro for free inside the, in, when you do the F module. So this goes and finds the code for the beam, for the beam, uh, for the beam module. And then it calls start, which spawns a process, which calls spawn process here and checks if, if we already have the beam running, then we don't do anything. If, it's, if, it, if we can't find it, we spawn a process running this this little fund here. We create a new process to do this, running the virus here with the beam. That registers its name, itself in the name here, so we can check if we only get one virus per, per node. We ask the net kernel, which handles, the, amongst other things, um, connections between the nodes, that if another node connects up to it, send me a message telling me that. This is just telling tell, tell me when nodes come and go. And now I write out I'm infested and I go to the loop. And the loop is very simple. When it gets a node up, which I'm getting from the from the um, uh, net kernel, I infest that and I just say that's joined and I sit in the loop here. I'm just sitting in a loop every time I get a node up, I infest that node. And the infest function 
that's called uh, with the node here. And this, uh, what I can say here, this is equal to um, uh, the, the node here is equal. I can, I can use this equal the beam here to set pull pull what what I get in here from the whoops from the beam to a tuple with the mod, the bin, and the, and the file. So this is the module name, this is the actual binary, and this is the file where it was found. Now I do an RPC call to the other node, and I load that code in. So now I've loaded the virus code into the other node through, through the RPC, which is just a standard mechanism that's implemented in the, <coughs> in the libraries, and then I start it. So now I've infested the other node. Then, and this, this, yeah, this is how simple this is to write a virus. Uh, which running which runs through um, uh, distributed alloy and yeah and and so it continually makes processes till uh, or is it just create one virus per machine or is it just yeah it just creates one virus per machine. okay and they all good. start talking to each other I'll show you I'll show it later I've got it somewhere so I'll show it later excellent and uh, by the way Duncan McGregor uh, made a comment I'm giggling never seen this before so. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is one thing we say if you're running distributed outline, um, I can say this now I'm saying it both as a joke and extremely seriously, you must trust all the code that everything that is sent to you. Because mm -hmm. here I'm saying I, I've got contacting this other node and I'm telling it to load the virus code to it. Right? So if someone can talk to me, they can tell me to load code. And then they can start that code. And if, if they can contact me, I cannot stop that. I, I yeah. can try and make it difficult for them to do it, but if they're slightly smart, they can get past all that. So I, uh, Bob, Bob Calco um, mentioned, don't play this part of the video to your security team. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going bonkers. Yeah, so make sure make sure your uh, your code's behind the uh, wall. Yeah, I mean, you should be uh, yeah. checking it anyways if you're getting yeah. anything outside, like a SQL injection. Yeah, so our goal was to make, make a language we could define fault tolerant systems, not not safe systems and things like this. Mm -hmm. for it. So that's it. So yeah, that's what firewalls are for and DMZs. That's not our problem. Again, letting someone run code on your Allen system or LFE system, for that matter, is the same thing in this case. It's like giving someone root privileges on your note on your machine, right? Yeah. You do that, very trusted people. So what I'm doing now is, well, I'm working with type notations um, because the Outline system has has type notations and some type checking tools. Working with that, um, I'll, I have a bit of a closure interface. Uh, it, 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 it's a, it's just a module that implements something. Closure like things for it. I didn't actually write it. Um, I, I've got flavors working on it. This machine flavors. I don't know how many people have seen flavors. They're before close, and um, they're much, they're much more fun. If, if anyone's interested after us, I've got a bit of a section on the flavors as well, too. I definitely would be interested. I don't think I've ever really uh, seen it before. Yeah. Oh, flavors, um, close is a limitation you're doing that. Flavors is much more versatile. You can use it for doing, uh, for, for implementing class hierarchies and stuff like this, but you can just mix things in. It's, it's like cooking, right? If I want a bit of this, I'll put this in. If I want some of that, I'll put some of that in. I'll add a bit more salt because I want more salt in it and stuff like that. I'll just mix things together. You it's fantastic. Plus, Sorry? Plus, plus allows multiple inheritance. You can just mix in whatever you want. Yeah, but I can do that. That's just cool. <laughs> CLOS has an advantage. Um, uh, CLOS I'm is looking. extremely general, but it's but uh, flavors is, is designed... Um, from a single perspective, it, it says, okay, we have one trick and we're going to make it do everything. Yeah. CLOS has every known trick. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You just, you just, depending what components you put in, you can make them behave like class hierarchies or not, or put things together. And, oh, it's wonderful. Uh, this machine structs, um, I'm, this is something I've been looking at for a while, but I'll, I'll get back to doing that. Again, I have to implement it on top of something else, right? But yeah. So why? Well, that's easy. I like Lisp. Um, I like Erlang. And I like to implement languages on top of that. So that's why implementing LFE signature. So, Solid so that's 
Thumbs up. <laughs> I said solid reasons. Thumbs up. Yeah, 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 yes, of course, of course. So what I want to try and show here is some examples. Um, you're seeing the screen I'm sharing. Yes, that's good. I'll put that down for the time being. So yeah, so so here we're running. I'll start up an LFE shell. Um, so we're running up a little banner here, and I, I can do things. Uh, so well, I can do plus one, two, for example. We're doing implementing all this here. Um, I can um, I can define a function. I can define a local function in the shell. A B, which would be slightly different. So we just do times A B like this. And this is this function purely defined inside the shell is just interpreted. So now I can do um, foo 42 and times 43, and I'll get back that one. And I can do recursive functions as well if I want to. Um, so yeah. I can I can set variables. I have, to, I have a few special the normal thing for setting variables is a let, which which is purely um, uh, scoped and I don't want that here so I, there's a special form set here so I can set x to be um, 42 like this. now I can, now I can do uh, foo of uh, 40 for 31 um, x and like that. Yeah, this is just what you expect but it, it's it's a REPL inside I can do things if I want to for and I can define recursive functions as well if I want to um, let's see Let's see if I can try and define factorial if I get this right. Do factorial, and we'll say, okay, we, if if it gets if it gets the argument zero, um, we get it's going to return one. And we're writing multiple clauses here. And if it gets the argument n, uh, we have a, a guard here when n is greater than zero. Okay. And we'll do that. Then we're going to call fact of um, minus n1, like that one. Now I've got find factorial. And that should work. If I do factorial of 0, I'll get back 1. If I do factorial of um, 5, I'll get back 1. <laughs> what have I got wrong now? Multiplication, subtraction. Okay, what? Oh, wait, never mind. Yeah. Uh, oh, something's gone wrong somewhere. Let's see. Um, you know what you need to do? Uh, yeah, what, what it is is that you need to say uh, uh, that when n is greater than zero, then it's n times fact n minus one. Ah, yeah. Sorry. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Otherwise, it's one. As I guess, it's, I guess uh, at the end, it's ones all the way down, right? Yeah. So if we'll just do that again, we'll get this right. And now it's um, fact of uh, times n like that. That's right. Now we, right it would be actually n times factorial of n yes. minus one, right? So it would be. It would, in other words, if it's like two, it would be two times fact of one, or. It's three, yeah, three times the pack of two, yeah. There you go. And one, that's right. Bum, 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 bum. Now I've got factorial. And now we'll just check it still works. We do factorial 5 is 120. And factorial 5,000 is a very it's large. A lot. <laughs> that, that's a because the Allen, the Allen system has um, um, big numbers built in. I, I have uh, one question. When you're uh, running the repo, uh, is that just a single process on the uh, beam? Yeah. It so is. we can have multiple repos and have it's them communicate with each other? It's three processes. Okay. Uh, one, there's, a, there's a REPL manager process and there's a REPL evaluator which does evaluations and there's one for doing the read, which means I can read things while, I'm, while the REPL is working and stuff like this as well too. Okay. Interesting. And I can see this because there's a built-in function called self, which returns the pit of me, right? That's me here. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a built-in function i, or there's, there's a shell function i here, which just lists everything with all the processes we're running at the moment. So these are all the processes we're running at the moment, and here are the ones we saw. This is me, right? 87. And um, so I can I can process lots of things. So I can do I can define macros in here as well too. Is, is there is there a me myself and I joke hidden in there somewhere? 
Uh, not really. Not really. We just, <laughs> no, we just no, have to keep the name. We have to call it something, right? <laughs> no, no, no one's come up with that joke yet. <laughs> yeah. That's and the next, um, uh, the so, next version of Erlang, they'll come, they'll come up with it. Yeah. So the shell, the shell keeps track of everything. It's got a state. There's a, there's an evaluator which sort of evaluates all these things and keeps track of it. So all these are kept in an internal environment dollar variable, which I can look at. Actually, it's accessible. And if we look at this here, we see an awful lot of stuff here. For some reason, I cannot scroll the screen anymore, and I don't know why. Um, let's see. Hope it won't scroll. I don't know exactly why that's not scrolling. I'll just stop this and try to start again. We'll see if, it, if, it, if that's the reason. Yeah, there's something there. And then we'll so this uh, this REPL is not exposed to the is not exposed to compiled code as eval or anything like this. Uh, you can you can call eval. The 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 the, the evaluator is done in a module. What did I create one now? Let's see. Did I get that where, where did that go? Uh, yeah. While you're doing that, I just want to mention on uh, Duncan McGregor's comment. He's talking about this. He says, "Yeah, it's really nice. If the eval process crashes, it doesn't bring down the repo. The server process just restarts it." Yeah. That's pretty yeah. cool. Uh, what what is happening here now? Let's see. Well, now I've got to try and start another REPL here. Um, we're here. Yeah, now we've got one. Let's see if this works. This works better now. We'll do P to this NYC. And now we'll start the, we'll start LFE again. And yeah. Uh, Oh, well, it's doing fun, but we can look at the environment here. This is the environment here. Now I can step through it, and here we can, I can see all the local variables. Again, this is just taken from the, the local variables. You can keep saves the last values, the last ones, the last variables. This I just took from from common list. And here are all the functions. Here are all the functions and macros defined in in the um, in the shell. So we see here, here the i was is a function, no arguments, which just returns, just calls the LFE shell i here for it. I can do one here, which looks at information for lots of processes. And I can actually create a PID as well, too. Uh, yes. The, um, what's the, the hash M? That, that's that's the syntax for a map. A map. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Right. So if we that's go up here and see, we look at this map here, there's there's one key. And um, this, uh, which is valued deal for it. I'm changing the syntax in version two. It'll be there'll be they'll have parentheses around the pairs to make it easier to understand yeah. what's going on there because that becomes pretty comes very quickly quite unintelligible. I yeah, think. I mean, yeah, right now basically it's a P list instead of an A list. Yeah, so now that there'll, there'll be at least so you say this, this be a list around say the doc bit here and it's an end like that. More right parentheses, but uh, at least pair them together a bit better, right? And doing other things. Yeah. But yeah, so th these are the functions for it. And if I if I if I just do if I just go back and do the final foo here, then we'll do um, times a b here. And now I look at dollar n here, and we'll see up here. Here we uh, here's a foo function I've added. So everything's in here, which means I can redefine this stuff if I want to. But then I'm then it's up. It's my fault. So I can do this. And then if you yeah. load some sort of module, it'll show up in there as well? Uh, no, these aren't kept in a module because then I'd have to be recompiling the module every time I added a function to it. And then you run into problems with the code handling. Okay, so um, there's like there's stuff that's in modules and stuff that's outside modules. It's like two yeah. separate. And the things outside the modules, they're, they're completely local to the REPL. Yeah. The evaluator function the evaluator module, there's a module call. We can look at that. It's called um, LFE eval. And here it's got these exported functions here. And we can evaluate expressions. We can evaluate forms and things like this for as well. And then here we just pass in an environment. So I can call um, LFE uh, eval colon expression. And we will, oops, call on there. And I can evaluate the expression times. 43, 44, like that, and I get back that. So I'm just passing in the literal and sort of evaluating it. Yeah. If I was to pass in an environment, I could have functions defining the environment and stuff like this as well. 
Um, yeah. So again, well, this is just what it's compiled with. Uh, we see all these flags here saying, because the, 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 seeing the, the system's quite old, things have evolved. So we have flags saying, well, well, if it has these things or it doesn't have these things and stuff like that. That's what all this stuff is for. But yeah. And then we can look at other things. I mean, um, let's see which ones I've got here. We, we, we can look at LS. There's an LS, built an LS shell command here. I can look at things. What have I got here? Um, yeah, we can run something. We can run. We can run something in the background. If we look at ticker here. So we look at the ticker module, ticker LFE, and we make this big. Well, I'm an Emacs user. Okay. So we have the module ticker, and it exports one function start and exports the function tick loop. And when I call start, so if we call ticker, we see here that ticker is already compiled. Um, the system does not automatically compile things for you. So if the ticker module wasn't compiled, it wouldn't find it. But we'll start off with, so every five, every five seconds, that's five milliseconds, we'll start that, and it's going to write something out. I'm counting here. It's just running in the background, and every time we'll just write out the, write out the pit of the ticker start one. Here. So I can start another one, and now I've got two ticker processes running. And we'll see one is one is 96 and one is 98, and they're both running here. They're just running in the background, writing things out. And um, yeah. So uh, let's see if I do now set of um, p1 to dollar dollar. That's that's 96, and I set t2 to dollar dollar, and that's 98. So now I've got variables referencing these ones. And if I, what we look here, if I send it any message, it'll just terminate the process. So now I can send a message to um, T1. I'll just send hello. And we'll see that stops. And now we'll, now we'll only see tick, tick two. And I can stop that one as well, too, if we want to. You're stopping. Why aren't they stopping? It should stop us. If they're not, oh, no, well, never mind. There's a simple way of doing that. I, I can stop them very simply, simply here. So I'll just load in ticker again. And I'll load in ticker again. And, wait. and now, now it's gone. Now they do. And this is just a problem with the code loading. Um, that's also one thing I want to show. That's why you have to be very careful if you if you if you're recompiling mod and reloading modules. Because the system allows you to have only two versions of a module, the old and the old version. If you try and load in the third version, it will kill off the old, delete the oldest version and kill any process running it. Which is what I was doing here. I was loading in twice and killing all the tickets, right? Is that a beam? Actually, I'll go ahead. Is that a beam limitation or is that uh, that's, beam? That's beam. Okay. That's beam. I cannot do anything about that. I mean, that's what I mean. Pretty if reasonable. I want to bypass this and write packages that are more, say, common lispy, I'd have to, I'd have to put a layer on top of managing that. Right? I think it's, it's pretty reasonable for it to, to kill, to only keep like two versions, right? Like it's like sort of the, the blue green deployment model, model. If you need more than that, you're probably doing something pretty crazy yeah. and you should probably define yeah. your semantics clearly rather than rely on what somebody else guesses your semantics might be yeah yeah having having two two versions allows you to control upgrades mm -hmm. yeah because i can have a process running i wrote a new version the process runs the old version then i tell the process to migrate to the new one and it can upgrade and do things in a yeah, adjust, adjust data structures and things like that that need to be done i've got another one here for something slightly more complex so i want to implement a separate process which is a counter because I, I don't have shared data, so if I want to share data, I, I have to put in a counter. I have to put in a process, right? So here we can run counter, colon, uh, start. And that just starts up a process, which is a counter process. Whoops, I should have done um, set C to that. No. But now C is equal to the counter. I can run multiple counters if I want to. So now I can, I can, for example, I can call counter colon add and add and I'll send it to, um, I'll send it to C and I'll add, I'll add 15, say for example. And that just returns 
just returns a message, it just sends a message when I get back. If I want to look at the counter, I can now do counter colon get. And uh, this is enough to see here. And I get back 50. Now I add again 150 and do a get. I now um, get 165. So what I've started up here is I've started a process that sits in a loop like this. And when it gets an add tuple, so when I send add, I send an add tuple to it when I get with, with, with the atom add and the number, and that just calls self recursively and bumps the counter. And sub decrements the counter and get just re sends a reply back. It's a, it's a synchronous call here. Synchronous in the sense we send a message and we sit and wait for a reply message and just return it. So we have a little process here running. And this, this process, um, I can start multiple counters. Yeah. Is that is that tuple add number and the uh, hash pren sub number? Those are just two different ways to yeah. say the same thing. Those are yeah. symptoms, different symptoms. Yeah. So here, here I'm writing it out as a tuple sub, and here I'm using the back quote. Um, here I'm using the back quote to, with the hash um, notation. Yeah. yeah. Which will with the, with the tuple like, which just yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh or I guess I guess the the tuple one is basically you're giving it the type, right? You're you're doing it based on Type dispatch, whereas the other one is like more pattern dispatch. The same. That actually expands. If we do this, wait a minute. Whoops. I see. So if we go back here, I can do macro expand. So I do have the macro expand call here, and then I can expand this, uh, which was sub. We can do sub here, comma number. That expands a couple sub number. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the back quote, oh, yeah, the back quote is a macro is, is implemented as a macro yeah. instead of macros. That's all it's doing. Now I can start a separate one if I want to, of course. We'll go here, we'll do counter, we'll set um, C1 to that. So that now there's two counters. And if I do if I do um, um, get of C1, it's zero because there's nothing in there. And again, if I do get at C, it's still 165. So then I'm just running two separate counter processes. Now I can start up as many as I want to, as many as I wish for. And I can stop them as well and do things like this. And what I did, what the final thing I just want to show here, well, I can show as much as you want, but um, if we go here and look at this one, if we go to another module here, so here I'm running raw, basically raw LFE on top of our line here. But I just want to show I can actually use the OTP system um, in here. So now I'm going to run this as, a, as what's called a gen server. And a gen server, um, that's, an OTP, that's an OTP behavior which for, for doing client servers. It, it implements basically the top group and gives you a lot of functionality for that. For doing it. So I do a gen server start here. We'll, we'll run one of these, right? We'll, we'll run one of these. So did I compile it? I'll just check I compiled it. So now I can do counter GS here, and I'll start. And I'll start here. So now I'm running. I'm, ru I'm running one here. And now this is running a gen server. And from, from one point of view, it's done, doing exactly the same. So now I can do counter uh, counter GS, and I can do add. Uh, what do I call it? I call it C1. C1, I can add 200 to it. And now I, if I do count to get of C1, uh, I can get that. It's going wrong. Gen server counter. It didn't do it. Why, why wasn't it doing it? I think C1 is the previous Very one. Very simple one because respond. there's a bug in the code. Uh, do we get it just and you get that should do it why isn't it doing it i don't know we'll see. there's a bug in the code somewhere but um hmm. i could do the ad but i couldn't do that oh reply counter counter yeah that should work we'll try this again sorry we'll just try once again and see what's going on here Oh, 
Ah. Yeah, okay. So we wanted C1 to be counted GS star. So I was running the wrong one. That's why I was, that, that's why I wasn't working. Um, yeah. So now I can do it. And now I can do counter get C1 and it returns exception function call do for proc, blah, blah, blah. What's going wrong there? Ah. Oh. Uh. Demos. <laughs> I'll do one last test and then we'll see what happens. Just three characters away. So now we will start. We will start uh, Tom Small mentioned that the response is a tuple, not a pig. And right, we're doing that. And now I can do uh, DS colon add DS 500. I think, yeah, I think you have to get. Um, the second element of that tuple, because the pit is the second. No, that, that's yeah. Um, Doctor McGregor um, mentioned that. Uh, okay, I guess in this example, you don't have to. Uh, no, no function. Also, when you're using Gen Server, you can register a process with a name, and just call the module itself for the single yeah. pattern. Now we do counter. Uh, anyway, you guys added CG. It's it's uh it, you see how it's uh, okay and pid, I think you're you're you have to extract the pid from that that tuple, the second element of the tuple. Oh, the GS, I exported it. Yes. Now, where your where your mouse is right oh, now? Yeah, something's gone strange here. Exporting the add function. We just recompile it to make sure. Counter GS. Last last attempt. Uh, CG, we'll do CG counter column start. We're up and running here. And now we should be able to do a counter GS add CG to 500 and a no function clause matching gen server cast. Uh, yeah, it's, it's because it's because the PID is the second element of the result from counter GS start. Ah, right. Sorry. That was my fault. Okay, now 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 I know what's happening here. Um, the the counter GS start is returning an OK tuple, and I was used, I was sending that tuple as the address, which means it didn't work. Now it works, and now if I look at CG, it works. And now it will work. And now I can um, add things to it, and I can add some more. I can add another five hundred, and now I can do a get, for example. And get back the value. So why would I want to bother doing this? What I mean, this is more much more code than my simple one is because I get I get a lot of nice system features. For example, I can I can turn on tracing here of CG. I can turn that on to true. Okay, this is just built-in functionality I get automatically by the behavior. And now when I do a get, well, it's writing out it's writing out it's getting information back. It's, it's getting a request from it, sending value back to it. I can add and do things like I can do sub, for example, here. And I'm just getting all this information from built into the system, which allows me to do these type of things. So you have stayed. This is features I get from the very fact that I'm using behaviors as well, too, for it. Um, I can also get error, I can get error, efficient error reporting and all these type of things. And it just works together. You've, you've, you've resurrected global variables. A any more questions? Anything I'd like to, you'd like me to show you? Is it, is that usually what this kind of thing is used for? Like you can sort of have like a global variable somewhere that keeps the state, and then that that's that's why you don't need a global that's variable right. in the language. Particularly with that, right. and uh, it's in the counters. Yes. Yeah. Um, so what would this can we just take a short five minute break? And then I, what if, would this talk sound I'll like? Come back and talk a bit about flavors, but you have to tell me if you want to see it or not. Otherwise, we'll just go on. If you want, if you want to see, um, yeah, I think there's a uh, there's a little communication problem between us. I don't know if you hear us, but um, uh, yeah, some people yeah, have some questions. So um, whoever wants to uh, talk, I think uh, John, did you had a question. Yes. Yeah, we'll go on. I don't think he hears us at all. Okay. Um, I think our uh, new people still live. Yeah, we're we're here. Um, we're here, but uh, 
for some reason we'll get, uh, yeah. we're losing the then we'll, uh, go then we'll go on okay yeah so if you if you, you if you have your chance, to. You uh, chance to. i don't hear you okay can you hear can you see me um, i can't hear you i'm afraid okay uh oh great because you can't see us <laughs> uh just restart the browser <laughs> he doesn't know what you're telling him yeah i know i, I uh or maybe in the in the message yeah or either that or just shut down the channel and start it again well i i think the channel is fine he just has to restart his browser he'll he'll reconnect and then we'll be fine we don't know how to, there's no way to tell him to do that well um, out of bandwidth like email we need, we need pigeons. We need, anybody, anybody have any messenger pigeons? He, he's talking in the comments. <laughs> he hear, okay, now he can say oh, there you <laughs> Good old pen and I'm pigeons. sending you privately. I... Uh, wait, I'll wait a minute. We'll try like yeah. this. I think this is the only one. What do, you, what do you call that when you say you not restart the browser, but uh, my brain's uh, hurting? Um, Refresh. And you might actually sometimes need to actually uh, restart the whole um, browser sometimes. Okay. Our time has helped us out. Device. Okay. Now, it's, now I can hear you guys again. I don't know what yes. happened, but I just lost contact. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we got we got cut cut off. We were, I wasn't sure if there was a delay or what was going on. But anyways, let's uh, let's continue. Uh, John Cowan, you had a question. Yeah. Um, what would this talk look like if you were making it to an Erlang audience? How would you sell them on Lisp? Um, that would be very difficult. Okay. <laughs> because uh, Lisp doesn't always have a very good reputation outside the Lisp community. Well, let's say they're let's say they're open minded. I mean, what would you what would you tell them the advantages are of this um, familiar syntax besides the macros? Well, the list the, the syntax is very simple. I mean, you can describe the list syntax in under five minutes, right? Because everything looks exactly the same, right? <laughs> it's a list. It's a list where the first thing says what, then you got the arguments to it. That could be a defun or it could be a function call. So the syntax is very simple. Um, I, I, I would I would definitely talk about the macros. I mean, if you if you're comparing this to Elixir, one of the things Elixir uh, they're selling that with is, is the mac. It has a macro package for it. Erlang has one, but it's really good. Um, I like the syntax. A lot of people don't like the syntax. Um, so it's all these, it's all these parentheses everywhere, right? They wouldn't like that. So it, I don't know. I, I honestly quite don't don't exactly know why how I would sell this for it. For me, it was easy. This was this this was my first high level language above C and Pascal, right? So one, once you know that, every, you compare everything to it. And I think I learned, I learned Prolog afterwards, then everything else is pretty pretty trivial, right? Right. I, th um, I think you'd need some sort of like killer application uh, uh, or something, right? Like show them some sort of thing you can do with Lisp that you wouldn't be able to easily do in our life. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I think, yeah, I quite agree with Zaykul here. Ma Alan macros suck. Um, <laughs> like I, I have like they, they suck. They suck on purpose. <laughs> okay, because I, I, I'm the one who implemented them. I didn't, I didn't think we should have them. And they told me I, we should have macros. So I, I basically took C macros and made them even simpler. <laughs> so you're just like I don't want you to use them, so I'm gonna make them as painful as possible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're like, if you want macros, you got to use more parentheses. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I will give you. I will give you the thing you deserve. <laughs> yeah. I, I think. The, I think. I think the problem with with selling this e macros is that um, <laughs> is that. Um, you have to show it can do something better than in another language. Mm -hmm. I think that's the problem. And something which other people will, will, will uh, see as being better. Okay. I think, that, I think that's the problem for it. It's, it's, all, it's all very well showing a very good application in it, but then you have to tell them, well, they, you can't, they can't do anything like that in their own language, in, in another language. To which they reply, and 
we have experience of this in the Lisp community. Why would you want to do that anyway? <laughs> that's another one, right? That's another one, yes. Yeah, that, that's another problem. But um, Macros? What macros? Right. You don't need those thinking right. macros. Right, you just, yeah. type, just type out everything, you know, in longhand. <laughs> well, if, if we get back to the original outline, one of the reasons one reason we had we didn't put much of a macro package in is we explicitly wanted to be we were explicitly wanted to be explicit. So you should write exactly what you want, exactly what you get, right? Right. And one one problem with macros. Well, I said they're a path to to, to heaven, but they're also a path to hell, right? Because <laughs> you can yeah, write macros to apply tastefully, comprehensible. Yeah, you can. Yeah. And it's just too easy to do it. And yeah, so. Can you mix and match languages? Like Elixir and LFP and Lua? Sorry, once again? Or do you have uh, modules that are written in different languages on the, on the Bean platform? Yeah, 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 you could do that. Uh, I mean, you could, I mean, there's no problem. So what, I mean, what I was showing here, I mean, you can quite easily, if we just go back to um, sharing my screen again, mm -hmm. Um, so I, I also have one more comment myself. I, just talking about this subject, uh, I don't think LFP's uh, feature is about bringing Lisp to Erlang. I think it's about bringing Erlang to Lisp. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the really big thing is that the Erlang uh, platform has a huge pedigree and uh, you know um, is, has this made in distributed environment that's all built in. And then you can have your Lisp programs utilize that, so you don't have to rebuild it from scratch. Yeah. Lisp tra traditionally has always been like in a big monolith, right? Like the, the applications are running in a huge monolith, um, and you just load all your code in that one image, um, yeah. and ev everything just sort of has access to everything. And then when you <laughs> when that dies, then uh, you know you have all the state that you've accumulated and, and need to recreate. Um, but Erlang has this sort of distributed nature, which is completely antithetical to the default yeah. um, approach. But that's that's what gives it something yeah. valuable, right? That it is antithetical, and therefore yeah. it allows you to do completely different things. Yeah. Well, we saw just by a very simple example here. Um, if we look now, we'll just call. I can here. I should be. So if I just call Erlang, call on um, system info. This allow this is a this is the Erlang module contains a lot of built-in contains all the built-in functions actually. But there's one called System Info, which allows me to look inside the system, and I can do things. I can do things like uh, process count. I think it was called. Yeah, this tells me I'm running 54 Erlang processes at the moment, because I've started up a number of them, and um, I can run well. The basic uh, the basic Erlang system can run 262,000 processes at the same time. So it, it, this that that is what that's one of the things you're selling. This this way of looking at concurrency, using concurrency to build your system, is baked in it to down to the lowest level. And here I'm just showing some simple examples uh, with my counter. Right. Right. I mean, yeah, beyond concurrency, but distribution. Yeah. Right. Like and the distribution. I mean, if you if you want, I can show the virus. <laughs> we can do that. We can do that. Uh, we'll we'll stop that. So I'd have to start up an LFE with a minus s name a here. Now we're just running. This one's running distributed, and now I'll start up another node here, um, which is also running distributed. Let's call this another name. This is running B here. And by the by default, they don't know about each other, right? So let's see. I don't. I don't think I have the LF, the virus here. No. So um, if we now do, if we now stop. Ah, here we. This this one can run the virus here. So we'll start up the virus here. Be here now. Virus colon start. Yeah, and this one's infested now, right? And um, I can start up a third one here. Well, we can now. So now I can I can connect up to that one by doing net add and colon ping to it. And I want to ping to um, be at absolute. Bang! I, I pinged it, and now I'm infested. Okay. <laughs> because I can, got the connection. This got the connection to it. Now we can start another one here. 
we can start one called C, right? We'll start an Erlang one. Well, it's well, the same thing. We'll just start an Erlang minus L, LFE minus S name C here. And now I'm running. And now, for example, um, C can ping, ping A, right? It, it, whoops, that's not going to work. This will. This is one major problem. Um, ping, ping, we can we can we can ping A here. Oop, yes, and uh, oh, now I'm infested. I found out bees joined, and they're, they're all infested, right? So, yeah, how easy it's infested. Just because they're talking with each other. Yeah. Yeah. But it can do a I lot see of other these everywhere. They can do a lot of other <laughs> things as well, too. So, for example, this is again what the underlying system gives me. So, if I go down to control G here, and now I do, um, let's see if I get this right. I can ask the questions here. So, now we start on the, on the node. Uh, we'll start on B here. I can start a shell on B here. By running um, LFE server should work. So now I'm running here, and now if I look here, I'm running two things. If I connect to the second one here, I can see no, it didn't. It didn't like that. Um, ah, sorry, no, no, it was wrong. No, no, it was wrong. Um, we do G here. I do. I do remote. B at absolute. That's Ben Bean, by the way. Now I do um, LSE shelf. Okay. Now I should go to connect to it. And now I'm seeing I'm, I've just started up a shell on the on the B node over here, right? So now B node's running two shells. One, the one I had here, and the one I had here now, and the one I started here now. So again, this is just a feature of the distribution. So I can run these things across it. And if I do things here, I can do, um, I can get my node, which just happens to be B node, and I can do, um, I can do I here, look at all the processes running on the B here. And now we see um, I'm process 113 here. And here, up here, we've got the other shell as well, too. For it. So all these things just work. The distribution mechanisms just work because the built in mechanisms work. And this fact that I'm running a shell on another node and or the REPL on the other node and, and the REPL on the other, the, it's the other node doing the IO and I'm seeing the IO here, that all comes almost for free. So yeah, there's just a lot of things you get get in the system, just getting back to the distribution mechanism. Um, yeah. And of course you can run the virus. Yeah. Um uh, before I, 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 I take it over to Tony to ask a question, I just want to uh, bring some, uh, I, there's some good messages from uh, YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, Bob Calco said that messaging, messaging systems are built in Erlang. Uh, AMQ, RabbitMQ, et cetera. Jabber was originally written in Erlang. Yeah. Also, um, what else do we have here? Um, and also, um, <laughs> Uh, Jackson Bennett asks, uh, is Erlang a widely used language? So I guess uh, um, those are things. Oh, yeah. Also, someone mentioned WhatsApp. I think this is like their secret ingredient. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is why we bring this stuff up, because this is the uh, secret sauce that makes you look like a genius at work. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The WhatsApp servers are written in Erlang. Mm -hmm. okay. And so they have um, really been used. And, uh, and yeah. also, uh, so so Tony, uh, you raised your hand. What would you like to ask? Hi, uh, can everyone hear me? Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, I had uh, two questions, but I, I will uh, ask the um, ask only one of them, unless no one else has any other questions. But uh, my question was regarding um, uh, tooling and workflow. So, for example, racketeers have Doctor Racket. Uh, common lispers are. Um, being on, mm. uh, you know, um, uh, Emacs and Slime. I use Vim and Vittle, Brittle Vim mm. scripts to send snippets to a, um, a terminal like an animal. Um, what, um, how does your development process look like with uh, LFE and what options are available? Okay, so um, the standard build tool for, for running Erlang is called Rebar 3. 
and that rebar the rebar that rebar has now an LFE, LFE interface to it that was written by was written by Duncan McGregor by the way he, he wrote an LFE so you can run rebar and use that to both work on Erlang and and, and LFE things as well at the same time for it. And that that's 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 the standard Erlang build tool for building things these days. Um, I use Emacs. There are a number of other editors that can talk with it. Uh, I don't know how many of them of them have LFE modes though. However, I'm afraid. But, yeah. Got it. Thank you. But, yeah. Um. So. Uh, Tom Small, uh, well, there's there's two things. Uh, maybe I should get our premises first. Uh, what are list machine structs? Uh, it's just a way of implementing structs on list machines with an interface for doing that. Okay. That, 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 um, that's also, what they are. And also, I don't know how they're done want you to go more into the uh, flavors stuff. You said you were, yeah. mentioned that it, people were interested that you show an example. So, Tom Small. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll show flavors. It's, it's much it's much shorter. It's much shorter, uh, but we'll just do that. I'll just get this down now and I'll get the flavors up here and we will start them up. Uh, yeah, and now we will do that and uh, pop me back up here. And oh, am I sharing at the moment? No, yes, I am um, sharing. Yeah, I do see, I do see your uh, screen. So we'll start this up the flavors here. Whoops, we can put this down. I'll go back to the beginning, perhaps. Put it it's, it's not, this is not as long as all, uh, uh, as long as the other one. Don't worry about it. Okay. So, again, this is implementing flavors. Of, uh, mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. And click the uh, video icon so we can also see, see you talking while you're doing it. Okay. Thank you. So, do I have to start the video? Um, they, the, uh, so, on the bread browser, the, the, the ah, little okay, video icon yeah. will put your camera inside the, uh, Screen yeah. that you're sharing. There you go. Great. Okay. So we're sharing the screen there, and we get up there. Can you still see me? Yep, yeah, we can yeah. see you. So, yeah. So um, this machine flavors. It's for implementing objects on top of Erlang. Erlang does not fit very well with traditional objects, right? In the sense that you see in, in, in a, say, like Java or C Sharp or something like that. Objects. It just doesn't fit very well with that. Um, the, the thing that you mentioned at the beginning was because uh, Alan Kay, he, he said that the, for him, the most important thing about object orientation was, was isolation and message passing, which we do. So in that sense, we're very object oriented. But this whole idea of classes and things like that they, and instances just doesn't fit very well. You know, we'll also see some examples when we're looking through here. But this was just me having a bit of fun. So we'll look a bit at list machine flavors and a bit about implementing them and implementing flavor instances as well too. Yeah, that's that's the list machine logger for the LMI machine. So what is it? It's an it's an object it's an object oriented system running on MIT, MIT list machines. It didn't have a final version; it just kept developing it, and after a while, it became, migrated to, uh, to close when they worked there. So it was expended built the whole the whole life of the list machine. I think they're much more fun. So I define a flavor like this. This is this is this is how I do it in LFE. So I define a flavor with a name. It has a set of instance variables, I have components and other options. And I can have method definitions. And I can define local definitions. And I, I have to end it with an end end flavor here, which you don't need in the, in the LMI one. But I need to do that. And the local instance variables they're local to each instance, and um, I can give default values. And I can, they're calculated when when the instance when the instance is created. This, so far, it's pretty straightforward. I can have options here, so I can say which instance variables I want to be aut automatically gettable, settable, in initable. So by default, they're all private, but I can say some, some these are going to be gettable, these are going to be initable, so I can set them when I start and things like this for them. But I can always write methods to access them anyway, but this is just the default. This is when I'm making components, so I can, I can say, okay, I'm making a flavor, and I, I don't really know what components you're going to put in there, but I'm expect I'm saying they have to have an, they have to have these instance variables somewhere because I'm going to be accessing it. And the same thing with methods and flavors and stuff like that. And I can define say that something's an abstract flavor, which means I, I can only use it as a component; it can't be used as a base. This is pretty straight, basic, straightforward stuff. Here. And this is taken directly from the um, from the LMI for flavors, right? This is not something I've done. 
Um, we can define me methods. We have different types of methods. This is how we define primary methods. Uh, in, 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 in the, um, uh, for that flavor, we'll see some examples. I've got some examples later for it. And I can define local function for the flavor as well too. So here we, we, here we, here we, this is where we're mixing flavors, right? So we have components. We can, uh, I can, when I create a flavor, I can say it has, it has a list of components that, that will be part of this flavor. And it defines the instance variables, the methods which can be used and things like this for it. So, so the, in, in the end, I'll get all the instance, I'll get the union of all the instance variables declared and all the components and myself. Same thing with the union of all the methods. And also, I can also see which methods are going to be used. So if, if a method is defined in multiple components, I'm going to get the one in the first component list. That will, that will shadow the ones coming later in it. But we can get around this by having demons. I mean, they were thinking, right? They were thinking here. So here's a very simple example of composition. So I'm defining two flavors. So here on the left side, I'll have a shape flavor right? um, with two instance variables, X and Y, and they're both settable. And I can define methods move to and relative move to and draw. I can also, I will also have methods X accessing X and Y as well too, so I can set them. So move to just gets a new X, Y and sets its own local instance variables to, to uh, new and new. Uh, relative move, move to, that just re relative moving. And I have a draw method here which does this. So just drawing that as a shape. Now I can define on the right hand side a circle which has its own local instance variable of a flavor, but it has a component of a shape. So I can set, make radius settable. And now, when I, when I do my circle, it also defines a draw method. So when I, when I do a draw on this, I'm going to see this draw method because that shadows the one in, in shape. Okay. I, I, I can show you this afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. but, Sorry, you had a, had a question, comment? No, um, actually, I should okay. mute myself because I'm just. Uh... Yeah, yeah. So yeah, th this is great. So here, so, but that means that means I can't hit this draw, right? What happens if I want to do something serious? I I don't want I want to do it even though it might be shadow. Then I can create demons, right? I can create before and after demons. So I have my whole long list of components. And I might, I, might, I might be running one of the, of the methods here, but if I create the four demons, then the before demons created in each of, these, each of these components will be run first before I run the method, and then I can run after demons going the other way. So I'll step down going forward, so I'll call, I'll call the, the method. It might be the first one, but I'll run all the demons, and then I'll run all the demons coming back up again. So even though I, 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 my method is not being used, I can use demons to make sure that I get things done which I need to get done. And a simple example of this one is, I have a moving object flavor, which has X and Y, and an X velocity and a Y velocity instance variables, and it all set the initial values are all zero. And they're all, they're all gettable, and X and Y are settable and immutable as well too. And I have my move to, which does new X and new Y, sets there and sets velocity, just sets new, the new velocity. That's my moving object. But then I want a snail, right? A snail, of course, it's a moving object, yeah. But it's a very slow moving object. Okay. So I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to set a snail running at 500 kilometers an hour or something like this. That'd be totally ridiculous. But um, it's a moving object. So we'll be using this this set velocity here. I want this set velocity, but I, I, I create an after demon here. So this is an after demon, which says that when I call set velocity, it'll do the moving object one, but after I've done that, I will check. And if the, velo if the velocity is, is too big, I'll, I'll, use the, I'll use my maximum velocity value I'll set here and, and done that afterwards. But this is set after I've, after I've done the method. So here I'm going in. Yeah, you can call this. You can call it set velocity. You can set it to whatever you want, but I'll make sure it doesn't get too big by using these methods. Right? We're using the the, the, um, the demons for it. This is this is very nice for for never losing control. If, if you always need control for it, and that's what the combined method is. It's the first primary method and all the before and after demons. 
that they're after that method, define that method. So first you do you evaluate all the, the four demons in component order. Then you add, then you do the primary method, which was the first one in the list that had it. So I can have, I can have, which we saw here, I can I can have an after demon without average actually having the method itself. And then I do all the after demons afterwards. This is a very nice little feature for getting hold of it. I, I, they were just having a lot of fun here for doing this. And as I said, the system kept evolving. So every version of the of the of the list machine that they'd be doing more things in the flavors and working with. So the implementation, right? Um, now it's starting to get a little bit tricky, making this work on top of LFE on top of Allen. So um, one of the things w when I define a flavor, I can define all my flavors in any order I want until I it's not until I actually create the first instance that, that all these things are put together. So I can I can I can define flavors A, B, C, D, which can which can have each other as components. But they're all completely independent until I start putting them together, and then they're, then they're all put, put through, through as well. Um, it, so it's difficult to build build each flavor all the time as the combined methods depend on the ordering. That means we have to be cunning. And what we do here is for each flavor, I create two separate modules. One I call the static module, which contains all the flavor information that's in the def that's in the def flavor. So it contains all the instance variables, what's gettable and shareable, and all this type of stuff. This whole thing, that's, that's just a mapping of, of um, the def flavor into, um, into a structure, which I can access, into, into a module with a set of functions. And then when I create an instance, then I create the, the, the dynamic module, which puts all these things together. And... Um, then I compile. I, I build that. I build that combined module, and then I compile that when I make the first instance. So the static flavor combines only flavor-specific stuff, and the dynamic. Uh, they're flavor-specific, but they combine contain all the combined methods. They create a runtime. They're not saved. They don't exist in code anywhere. But I can pre-compile up all the static ones and release those and make it release for. So yeah. So here's just a very simple example. Uh, the moving object, or the, the static one's called moving object flavor core, and it exports this bunch of functions which define this flavor, which was in the definition. It's got the name, it has the components, didn't have any, the primary methods, set velocity, move to, and here, here, are, the, here are the actual definition of the primary methods. These, are, these functions define the primary methods, et cetera, et cetera. It's one function called primary method, which uses pattern matching to choose which one I did. And here we've got the snail flavor core. And here we again, we have, we have components. We have all the things in it. it. It's a moving object. It's got after demons here. And here is the after demon definition, et cetera, et cetera. So this is all statically taken from the def flavor definition. And it, it knows about the other ones, but it doesn't put anything together. So this one, the, the snail knows that, that, that the moving object is a component, but it doesn't access anything in there at, at the time here. This means if, if, that if I made if I if I had another thing working with a snail we do with other things I could compile each of these separately until I need to put them together. Then when I create the first snail, then I create the snail flavor module, which implements the snail, the runtime, and then we we export the snail. Here we've got we have all the instance variables. Uh, here we have the component sequence. So it, it called, first we call the snail component. Then we've got the moving object component. And then there's a vanilla component built in as well too. So here is here is the component, and here is the component module name. And here we have all the combined methods. Okay. So here we say which which methods are combined and where they where they combine to and everything like this as well. So, and here is an instance of a combined method. So the set velocity combined method. Well, it, it calls the moving object primary method set velocity with self and args, and then it calls the snail after demon set velocity like this. And it's worked this out when it's built, when it's, when it's making this for the list of components over the world. So this is how it's implemented currently today, right? And that works quite uh, well. <laughs> yep. Actually, uh, uh, Tony Fischetti has a, has a question. So, uh, Tony, yeah. if you'd like to uh, speak, and you can uh, just, you know, 
interrupt or whatever, we usually allow people to just yeah. it's more informal type of discussion. So go right ahead, yeah. get into it. Oh, okay. Uh, everyone could hear me. Yeah. I assume. Okay, great. Um, uh, yeah. So I, I would hate to ask a question that I could uh, get from Google, but I thought uh, this would be um, you would as a creator would know far more than uh, what a Google search would yield. Mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning, before the uh, meeting began, I think uh, you mentioned that one of the things that LFE might not be best suited for is numerical computation. Um, and I was uh, wondering if LFE has uh, any bindings to, you know, like um, LAS or LAPAC, these are linear algebra libraries, um, but more generally what the, um, if there's any uh, scaffolding in place for like um, foreign function binding and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so we use what's, what exists in the Alan, the Alan the Beam system for. So the Beam has, the, the Beam has uh, built-in ways of, for example, linking in C code and then calling it from the Alang side and from, in this case from the LFE side. So that, that, that there's a method for doing that that's built into the system. Um, there, there come a few packages, that there's, a, there's a Java interface. Uh, which which uses this talk to Java, for example. Mainly it's just a pack of Java but Java classes that that, that understand our data. So the, the, this method is built into it for doing this. There's also a way of talking without external other operating system processes and communicating between the, this functionality is built into it. So that's that's typically how, how you do it, right? That's super cool. Thank you. And we seeing we do based on what we can just access this directly. There's no problem to and again, this is what I was getting around to what I was saying earlier. Of course, Alan's not good at everything. It's getting better at more and more things, but it's not good at everything. But it, it's, it's not too difficult to interface, put, plug other things in if you want. The basic interface is C, but I think they're working on doing a Rust interface as well too, at the low level. And you can, and you, you can load this into the system while the system is running. So I don't, I don't have to rebuild the whole beam. It, it can dynamic load in the object files and this. So, yeah. And so that's the next, the next one, just looking at, looking at instances. How are we going to implement instances? So how much they weigh? How accessible? Are they shareable? Are they persistent? Should they be garbage collected? How do you handle errors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, these are all the things you have to look at. So we sort of looked at code before. But how are we going to handle an instance? What, what, how are we going to represent an instance? And now we're getting into the problem of how do we handle objects, classical type objects, in, a, in an Allen system. I think that's exactly the problem we're looking at. And the common one is using processes. So there, there are, Allen processes are very, very lightweight. I mean, I can start, it doesn't take many microseconds to create a process. Um, so that's one way of doing it. It's very straightforward. They're shareable. They're more classic-like because they don't affect each other. They're handled by reference. I can, they can simulate local behavior. However, they're not automatically reclaimed. In that sense, if I create a process, it sits there until either it dies or I kill it. Right? It doesn't go away just because no one references it. Um, they are heavier than classic object-oriented instances. So that's uh, something you have to think about. And seeing you using message passing to communicate between them, it's very difficult to um, to handle recursive accents. So, so if instance A references references instance B, I still send a request to it, which is a, which is uh, an asynchronous message and sits and waits for the reply. But if but if B sends a, a request back to A, and A won't answer that because it's doing something else at the same at the same time, right? So that that that's just that's just a problem you get with having multiple processes doing it. Um, yeah. So here, well, this is just saying we're keeping all the instance variables in a map, and we're using that that map to access things and do that that that, that, that as well too. And yeah, um, it. Well, I do a bit of, a bit of extra handling. So if you send a message to yourself, then that, then that's that's translated. At compile time to a call, to a runtime actually to a call, so you you can call yourself. That will work. But if a, I mean, if a calls b, which then calls a in the middle of processing that message, then 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 they both both happily block. Right? That's just a problem with it. Uh, we can use data just just put everything in a data structure. That's simple. Um, it's very lightweight. 
this is how our lang records and LFCS trucks do it. Um, well, we'll give you records trucks on super steroids for doing this. But it's not shareable because these objects are immutable. They only exist in one process. And if and um, if I update, if I if I have this in a data structure and update lot, the, the new one, the old one will still be unchanged. So all the reference, the old one, will won't have the changes. Have to pass these around because I just have immutable data. There's just no way around that. And I can't share between. I can't change, can't share between processes. These ones here, I can share these between a process because they, they are a process itself, and the reference contains the PID, so I can, any process can send messages to it. But yeah, this is one way of doing it. And here I'm just again I'm using a map. Well, sorry, here I'm just putting them. Uh, I've got I've got the structure here, the, the self here. I'm just using that as a map and updating for this way. But I specifically got to handle reference. So if I do a send, if I do a send to that reference, that reference has to, that send request has to return a value for them and the updated reference, because otherwise any updates are lost. That's a that's a serious problem with this. It, it, it's perfectly okay, but it's not what you'd expect from something like using objects. And uh, the final one here is here we're being slightly sneaky. I think we're being overly cunning. Uh, there is something called ETS tables in the system. I'm not going to go into them, but um, their way of storing data is not shared, but it's globally, globally accessible. And it's quite light, lightweight, and, and then and I can handle them by reference as well too. So that means I can have multiple ones accessing this thing for it. And I can do something like this. I can I can have the flavors instance table here, and I can, I can get by accessing and reading out. Well, I'm not going to explain this, but I can do that, and I can put things in here as well too. And I store instance variables in the global table um, with references to each instance, also containing a ref containing reference to the instance which owns that, inst that, that, that variable for variable for it. So it's an instance, it's a variable, it's a value for it as well. Too. That works fine, right? But then you're getting slightly sneaky, and you have a bit of trouble with with um, uh, reclaiming things. They're not garbage collected unless you garbage collect them. And if, if some, if I'm garbage collecting instance, I have to go through and find all of them, etc. So it's not a very much way of doing it. And the way I went for what we do now is just to keep it inside a process. That's basically all I'm going to say about it. For it, but I think I think they're a lot of fun. Um, I can show you some more code here if we go out of this one and we now go here. Uh, by, the, by the way, I just want to mention something. It's I had nothing to do with the talk, but uh, I kind of like the way you uh, you have phrases like overly cunning and utterly terrifying. <laughs> <There's something laughs> it just sticks in my mind that you have a natural knack for this type of uh, language. I don't know. Maybe it's, is it laconic? I don't know what it is, but uh, maybe it's a uh, birdingism. I think we should create a new uh, <laughs> a new way of speaking. You know. Anyways, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it, it's. I think you you get it when you start thinking about things like languages and defining the base of systems. You have to you have to you start thinking about things like this. Well, well I do anyway. Since I also interrupted you already, I might as well bring up uh, uh, Duncan McGregor. Actually, wanted to chime in with um, uh, Tony's um, question, saying that you can use something like called ports. Which basically lets you talk to a program using Erlang messages, so you can run yeah. fast Rust, Go, etc. code with the results passed back to Erlang. So because everything in Erlang is data and it's just a fixed set of data, you can basically just communicate it like with any kind of process. Uh, yeah. that's how you uh, that's that, that's how you do things. Or like in Tony's case, also with R, maybe. Yeah, that's super cool. So yeah. Um, so what I need to do now is I, here's an example of a flavor. I've got I've got three flavors in one module. So I've defined the shape flavor. That's just well. If you go down here, we define the shape flavor. It's got an X and Y with the with the with the move to and the R move to. I can define a rectangle flavor on top of this, which has its own draw method, and I can define a circle flavor. And I can just I'm just try and load this in. Let's see if it works. I have to restart this again slightly here because I need. I need another LFV. Okay. 
that just sets up so it can find the flavors. Now, if everything works, if everything works right, I should be able to um, compile that. Okay. Let's see if it works. Cross your fingers. Can't find the flavors in crude that work. I thought I could. Uh, Ah, sorry, yep, there's a mistake, there's a bug here. Don't ask. Uh, now we should be able to do it. Don't run it, no, it's not. Yes, and now we should be able to see. Um, okay, even better. Then we're done after this one. Shapes, so, uh, sorry. Monkey, that, done. Yeah, now we can. Now I've got I've, I've got these cores. So now I've got these cores here, right? So um, let's see. Now to make sure I get everything correct, um, we do M of flavors. And we've got the instance NJ flavor. Yeah, let's see. Sorry, I just have to check this. I keep forgetting all this stuff. It's an include file, so we would define the flavor. I can make an instance, okay. So we'll set, we'll, we will make an instance here. Um, multi, we'll, make, we'll make a circle, we'll, we'll make a circle. So we'll make an instance. So we'll go up here and we'll make an instance of a circle. So we'll set uh, C1 to um, make instance of a uh, circle. Okay. We'll find out pretty quickly. And then I can set options here. And the circle, we can set the radius. We can set the radius to 25. Let's see if this works. And define make instance. Sorry, then we have to do flavors. Flavors probably make instance. We need to wait for this. Okay. So yeah, now I've got that. So now I've, I've now created this is a flavor instance. And now I can send messages to it by doing flavors colon send. Um, flavors colon send. And because this one was settable, it's also gettable. So I can call, I can send that, and I can send a value. I can send uh, getting the value of radius, and I get back twenty-five. Okay. And we also saw that this this was a um, uh, it's a shape, and the shape has an x and y. So I can now do get I can get x for it, and now I can see where it, where it's undefined because I haven't set a value to it. But now I can do I can do um, set x. And I can set the x to 100. Now, if I do get the x, I find it's 100. So now I'm working on this flavor for it, and I can do a, I can do a draw for it. I can send I can send a draw because the vanilla flavor um, includes a draw. Well, here we're also doing a draw, so we now do a flavors colon. Uh, sorry. Flavors colon send to C1. I can do a draw and we'll write back here and we get this draw here. So we get the draw in the circle app, etc. And I can just I could create just a just a shape if I wanted to. So I can do um, um we'll just do one more and then we'll quit here. So we can do uh, S1 here, and it's we're going to make an instance of just the shape here. And we will set, we can't set the radius because it doesn't have it, but we'll set x and y. So we'll set x to x to 20, x to 2250, and we'll set y to 20. Okay, so now my, uh, that should not be uh, shape, S1. So now I've made a shape, right? 
And now, and now if, if I send a draw to this S1, I'll get back something else, it's another one. So now I've got these two shapes working here for me. And um, let's see, the vanilla creates something, if I can remember correctly. We will do uh, okay. M of vanilla core. And that gets an, uh, what's it called? Ah, sorry, just want to check one thing here and we'll just do it done. Mm -hmm. Here's the definition of vanilla. It's the vanilla flavor, and it doesn't do very much. It's got a print. It's got a print self method. So if I now send to um, to S one, I can send print print self, and it get me. It's just getting back information about it. Okay. Well, let's see if it can do anything else as well too. Uh, yeah, it just prints the self. This is just the thing it is itself as well for it. I can I can I can set variables in it, I can get information out as well for it. And if if I now try and go here and um, try and do a uh, which we're looking at for the C1 up here, we're doing an X here. Well I, well, I can do the X because it has an X there, but I cannot do I cannot do an X for I cannot, for example, get a radius. Because it doesn't have a radius. That gives me an error. So yeah, this is just a simple example of it. And you can put together and make a lot of things here, what, what you want to do. And I think they're fun. I think I think it's fun yeah. for it. I, I think it's, I think it's uh, great it. to be able to use some of these uh, uh, features. If you want to program in this style with flavors, you can just, you have it. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's really good. Yeah. And, and it's, it's about as efficient as using the um for the counter gs for example i was using the i was using the gen server so i'm using that gen server back behind as well too um if we want to do this i think see if this works shall we uh six colon trace i don't think yeah we will do kid of uh it's zero one one three don't ask uh, we'll turn on tracing for it, yeah. and now I should be able, now if I send to one one three, which is a self, I send radius. I see it gets this message for it. We've got the send radius request, and it returns error undefined method back for it as well too. And if I now do, for example, uh, print self, we're getting this method, and it's returning this data for it. So, uh, so I've got, I've got all the features here I have for the for the behaviors because I'm using behaviors to implement it as well too. I can log things, I can get a lot of information out of it. I can, for example, do um, uh, things I can do. We can do get status. Get status of this one. And, then we can do and here we have the internal state of that of that server, the gen server, which implements the shape there. I get all this information. Yeah, so this is, this is one benefit, and I can quite happily put these in, in, in OTP supervision trees because they are OTP compliant and all this type of thing. So, yeah. so uh, let me uh, ask that everyone uh, over. Do we have any uh, final questions? Yeah, you must turn me off, otherwise I'll just keep going, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you can continue after the uh, live stream's over. We're, I'm going <laughs> to stick around forever. Um, but uh, if uh, no one has any questions, I do want to have some final comments. Um, Dig Ash on YouTube says, thank you for the great talk. Uh, Ogie just mentioned, thank you for the great talk. I'd like to thank you for the great talk. Um, and... Uh, uh, Okay, Robert, you just said the YouTube video. I'm gonna check that out later. We'll check that out. That's that's Duncan stuff, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's huge. That that's his uh, working with working with music generation through LFE. Yeah. Well, that's, I, that's, I sent him my email address, so I'm hoping that he'll uh, g uh, give us a talk. So yeah. um, maybe you can help us with that too. That would be great. But um, so I, I think if we don't have any more questions, I think we'll. Uh, 
we'll conclude the live stream. Um, I want to thank everybody here, and I want to thank everyone on YouTube. I think the comments and the questions were amazing. Um, I want to remind you, if you're on YouTube, to like the video so um, YouTube can know to send this to everybody um, on YouTube to share the video so we can get this video out to everyone on the internet, on whatever socials that they happen to be on. Um, and of course, to subscribe to the channel so you can keep getting more of these videos. And um, you can also check us out uh, for, at, at lisp.nyc. That's our, uh, that's our uh, um, website address. And uh, with that, I'd like to close the parentheses and uh, we'll see you again in the future. Bye. Okay.